Hello, and welcome back to Parlay. This one was written by iPatch Notes. Hope you'll enjoy listening. It's The Witch of Contradiction 3. Uh, we're getting close to the reveal of the witch herself. Uh, iPatch Notes has an intro as before. Basically, the idea of this parlay is an introduction to the damage and weapon scaling and sort of opportunity cost behind the number of hands you're using for your weapons. You'll see. Uh, so here's the summary. Pathfinder weapons are categorized by the skill and number of hands required to wield them without penalty. Lighter weapons are dexterity oriented and heavier weapons strength oriented. Two weapon fighting is dexterity oriented. However, multiple attacks are mutually exclusive with movement by default. We'll get back to that. Animal companions have their weapons, you know, their bites or claws, based on their size, which is in turn influenced by their level. And both animal companions and familiars get subclasses too. Ooh, a plot twist. Uh, this has been a very interesting way to learn about Pathfinder. Uh, it's such a surprise to hear that surely not player subclasses, right? Well, anyway, we'll get there. So from the top now, with those premises, I bet you begins. The last time, it was mentioned that the boon companion feat will leapfrog an animal companion four levels, such as from one to five or six to ten. Animal companion power is strongly correlated to class level, which will come up later. In common with Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, if that's where you're coming from, which it is for me, so I bet you is throwing me a bone here, Pathfinder 1st edition damage output scales with three common factors. Base damage measured in dice, extra damage measured in flat amounts and or dice, and total quantity of attacks. Once again in line with D&D, but significantly more codified, Pathfinder uses proficiency and handedness as weapon scalars. Simple, martial, or exotic, kind of a super martial weapons category, uh, and light one-handed or two-handed. For examples, daggers require little hand strength or training, so they're simple and light weapons. A greatsword is more demanding in mass and technique, martial and two-handed it is. The perceived beauty of this dynamic is that there is a mathematically sound, sort of, and scrutable process to balancing weapons. We're using daggers as a base, a larger damage die or more utility on the weapon will kind of cost proficiency or the number of hands it takes to wield it, which is maybe more complicated than it sounds. We'll get there. Dual wielding, furthermore, in Mathfinder, trademark, is inherently aligned to dexterity, with a minimum of 15, and two-handed weapons aligned to strength. This can be seen in finessable or dexterity scaling weapons, being primarily light and one-handed, as well as the systemic rule of 1.5 times strength scaling on weapons held with two hands. For the last piece of symmetry, offhand attacks have 0.5 times strength scaling to complement the main hand's one times scaling. As a result, any combination of handedness and weapon choice averages out yeah, nicely, sort of nicely. Let's look at the chart. So there's a couple of things we need to talk about here. You do more damage if you're a larger size. So you can see uh, that in each of the example weapons we have here, you do more damage with the weapon if you are a, a bigger creature. So a human does 1d4 with a dagger, a goblin is small, not medium, so they do 1d3 with a dagger. I feel like that would get to be a lot of bookkeeping really fast, but for, for most weapon sizes, the upgrade is obvious. You know, you're going from a d6, d4, d8, d6 as you go down a size category. Okay, and I would imagine it's relatively straightforward going up. You know, it's going to be d4, d6, d8, d10, d12, or 2d6. So I guess, I guess it kind of makes sense. I don't know. Um, Hopefully that's relatively regular, and it only gets weird when you need to go from a d4 down to a d3. Like, that's a little odd, uh, but I guess besides that, it would mostly work out. Okay, and so you can see that the, the whole idea of having a trade-off between how many hands or whether a weapon is martial is made clear here. You can see with each of the weapons, like a dagger is simple and light, so basically no requirements, you don't need to know how to use it, and you, it's a light weapon, so you can hold it in either hand, you can dual wield them, it's all good. And therefore, it has very low damage die, because that's it has utility, so it, it needs to have a lower damage die, or there would be no point to a short sword. This requires the proficiency, it's a martial weapon, but it's still light, you can dual wield them still, etc. 
A longsword forces you to not dual wield them, we'll get to that, and so you get a little more damage. It's also martial, you have to learn to use it like before. It says dual wielding half here, uh, and the idea there is that because it's not a light weapon, you can't dual wield them, but you can hold it in your main hand. I believe this is a difference from Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition that briefly tripped me up. I'm pretty sure that in 5th edition, you, if I remember correctly, we don't, uh, my players don't dual wield very much. So it's really just me thinking about this uh, for my own characters, which I don't play as much because I often am the, the one running the game. You need both of the weapons to be light. And so I think that's a difference in Pathfinder. Your main hand weapon doesn't have to be light. It's just that whatever's in your offhand has to be a light weapon. So you can dual wield, if you have the proficiency, a long sword and a short sword, or two short swords, but not a short sword and a, a great sword, of course, and not a long sword and a long sword, <laughs> um, because they're not light weapons. And you can't dual wield great swords, uh, not having any trait in the game that lets you dual wield great swords is for cowards but uh i don't know that they don't have that and so i'm just saying i do in my games <laughs> it's just really expensive and you can see that there's a kind of hmm hmm damage down scaling the half work a medium creature example does 2d6 with a great sword while a gnome a small creature does 1d10 with an asterisk you say that doesn't follow a formula well, if 2d6 is meant to be equivalent to 1d12, which it, yeah, sort of, it's more consistent, the average is more consistent, um, then 1d10 is down one size from 1d12, so that seems relatively regular to me, but 2d6 to 1d10 looks quite confusing on the page, don't you think? So that's something. Uh, by the way, you can't see perfectly because of the contrast, but uh, here we have a table difficulty rating. I would like to see a uh, different table difficulty ratings uh what would be three star three out of three star table difficulty no this is perfectly understandable it's maybe just pathfinder that is doing a math finder and causing this to be a little bit like <laughs> that's a lot of details for just how much damage like a sword does when you stab someone but uh what can you do i like that you made them all swords i think that's somewhat mentally useful so you can see how even though it kind of seems like how many hands you're holding the weapon in and whether it is simple or martial or whatever would be a relatively simple thing there's more design space than it appears because creature size is also a metric and also light weapons which are kind of like a like a one hand plus situation you know they they're even more one handable uh, you have weapons that are one-handed, but you can only wield up to one of them while dual wielding. One-handed, but you can wield two of them, or they can be in your offhand, if you want to think of it that way. And then there would be two-handed weapons that are only two-handed. Uh, there is also an additional dimension that I don't know if Pathfinder has in 5th edition uh, called versatile weapons. The idea with these is that you can use them with two hands if you want to, but they can also be used one-handed, and they have less damage if they're used one-handed. This is a kind of weird in-between thing between being one-handed and two-handed that, if you were to ask me, the exact design space is not fully clear, making me have like a small yawn just trying to like comprehend exactly what the purpose of having that is. So let's just just push your feelings down and let's move on. I It's really bad when the math finder is easier for me to wrap my head around having never played it than why there are versatile weapons. Now there are some reasons. We'll talk about it later. So uh, that, that all averages out very nicely, except, I patch notes continues, that Pathfinder has an elegantly staccato or awkwardly stuttery action economy, depending on who is asked. Where D&D can subdivide extra attacks and movement, like you can move, attack, attack, and then do the rest of your movement, for example, or move, attack, move, attack, move. Pathfinder's default expectation is that the multi-attacking character is an unmoving one. Movement and multiple attacks are mutually exclusive without an ability to rule otherwise. If the player is already within striking range, multiple attacks while dual wielding tends to win out, and if the player has to move first, the two-handed weapon will have a larger single damage packet. 
This mobility tax puts a systemic premium on ranged weapons. Yeah, I would imagine. Topic for another time. Okay. And melee weapons with reach. I do briefly want to touch on that, but there's actually a lot to say about this section. Yeah, you can imagine that if you can't multi-attack, you have a multi-attack, but you can't use it if you have to move first. A ranged weapon, if not heavily penalized, would thrive in that system. And it sounds like what you're saying is, yes, they're, they're, they are overpowered as a result. <laughs> Probably the only drawback is going to be that you can't deliver melee effects with them, but they do equivalent damage. It's kind of a problem that Dungeons & Dragons has as well. It's often, like, unless something specifically tells you to use a melee weapon using a ranged weapon doesn't lose you anything. You don't lose damage and you potentially save time, even though the movement flexibility is there. So if that were to remain a problem, I would imagine it would get even worse. And reach weapons also sound much stronger in this system. You know, it could make the difference between you needing to move at all and not, which in Dungeons & Dragons doesn't really matter that much. Therefore, the, the movement utility gained by reach weapons isn't significant. It's usually their zone control or like feet enabling and stuff or outranging enemies when they're also attacking you. But here, reach weapons may gain you damage in a way that they generally wouldn't in 5th edition, because you would need to not move at all instead of needing to move like a trivial distance but 5 feet, which might matter, uh, in Pathfinder. That's weird. Uh, that's That seems bad to me. <laughs> um, but the idea of the movement and multi-attack thing is sort of interesting. The whole melee dual-wielding versus two-hander situation is kind of complicated. I was confused enough about this that I did a little bit of research before this parlay. Uh, I just spent a few minutes looking things up, so forgive me if this is wrong, but this is my understanding. So in Pathfinder, you get, uh, in an iPatch Notes note uh, on the side, you wrote that people get multi-attacks, uh, just always everybody gets multi-attacks, even wizards get a multi-attack. So you have a multi-attack, and the expectation is that your marshal is doing like three or four attacks on a turn but only if they don't have to move that turn. So they got to get in range and then they unload their attacks. Now, if you're dual wielding, you don't get the offhand extra attacks automatically. Here's an example. We have great axe guy and dual wielding short sword and dagger guy. Great axe guy and short sword dagger guy both have four multi attacks. So great sword guy, great axe or great sword, I don't know, does four hits as you'd expect. Short sword and dagger guy. Now, you get four short sword attacks with the main hand, but the dagger, by default, you, as far as I could tell, you only get one multi-attack. You only get the initial one offhand attack. Now, there is a feat, a line of feats, that gives you the extra multi-attacks as well. Like, you can keep getting feats and you'll get more and more multi-attacks. Basically, as you get the multi-attacks for leveling up each time, you unlock the ability to get a feat, if you're eligible, that gives you the offhand multi-attack as well. But that does cost feats. Now remember, people familiar with Dungeons & Dragons, in Pathfinder, feats cost a lot less, like you get a lot more feats. In Dungeons & Dragons, it would be regular to have a build that was really, really good, but only got literally two, three, maybe, feats. And so paying one feat just to gain the multi-attack that you already got from leveling up would almost never be worth it if the build was planning to do a lot of melee damage. But in Pathfinder, you get a whole bunch of them, so it's like at least sometimes worth it, sure. But even so, you can see how with a, only a bunch of feats, is short sword and dagger guy doing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight attacks, which remember from the part earlier are balanced out to kind of mathematically equal the one, two, three, four greatsword attacks. So what the heck is the point of dual wielding, you might be asking. Okay, well, a few things, or what is even the point of <laughs> uh, two weapon, two-handed weapons? If you have a bonus to hit every single time you hit, the dual wielding is obviously going to add that up quite quickly. You know, imagine that you do plus two damage anytime you hit, no matter what you hit with. Hitting eight times versus four, I mean, how much weaker do the weapons need to be for that to not be stronger? You see what I mean? If they're about equal, as we established that they are, this graphic makes a nice kind of corollary for, you remember that discussion about the like 1.5 total hands, uh, 1.5 strength scaling or 1 and 0.5 strength scaling for a total of 1.5. So if that's equal 
and you get plus two damage any individual hit, then two, du dual wielding is way better because you get the bonus twice as often. That's going to end up equaling out to the damage of one or two extra attacks, one-ish full swing of the greatsword, and you'll end up ahead. It's almost like you did five greatsword attacks worth of damage. I mean, I'm just giving you a random mathematic example, but you get it. On the other hand, if you have a bonus that makes your like accuracy increase for the next attack, well, that attack, that one attack doing more damage would be better. So the greatsword wins out there. Or maybe the enemy has flat damage reduction, like they reduce all incoming damage by two. Now it's better to do less attacks for more damage. And that kind of makes sense, right? Like if they're wearing armor and you pierce through the armor with a great axe instead of by like plinking them with a short sword and a dagger, yeah, it kind of makes sense that the, the great axe would do more damage. That's nice. And they both have kind of a clear niche. I don't know if that exists in Pathfinder. I'm just saying if I were a designer for such a game, like I think this is a cool way to do a one weapon and dual wielding kind of balance, uh, I would definitely include a mechanic that lets you gain a damage mitigation. And then two-handed weapons are much better at overwhelming that. One-handed, and especially dual wielding, is much more punished by that type of thing. That just seems cool. And there's lots of benefits uh, besides all that stuff that I would like to talk about later, but let's finish out the text of the parlay first. So anyway, in summary, you get that the, the multi-attacking will balance out differently here and there. Now, my understanding from some basic math I saw was that all things being equal, if you pay the feat tax, if you will, the multi-attacking does slightly more damage, all things being equal, even before you have like a bonus that makes it do more damage. So even if you don't do an extra plus two damage on every single hit for some reason, attacking with your a long sword and dagger, let's say, your optimized dual wielding versus your two-hander, the dual wielding does a little bit more raw damage by a little bit, which you would expect because you have to use the feats. And then I, again, I would also imagine that it kind of synergizes better with some other damage boosts. On the other hand, there are some strengths to the two-handers too. Okay, continuing forward. We need to know this because, returning to animal companions and familiars, they follow yeah, the same kind of manufactured weapon rules that players do. Bestial attacks are in the realm of like bites and claws, but otherwise base damage, strength, etc. still apply. Animal companions have built-in breakpoints at 4th or 7th level, depending on the exact animal often growing in size to the next category, which, remember we established, makes you do more damage before. For example, the medium Tyrannosaurus rex grows its bite damage from 1d8 to 2d6, and its strength by plus 8 at 7th level. Under Boon Companion, that means as few as 3 druid-like levels turns the T-Rex into the rough equivalent of a fighter with a greatsword. Indeed, so we, we can see the relative effectiveness of companions here. You can get a pretty powerful medium creature uh, dual wielding a dual wielding wielding a greatsword which is the equivalent of dual wielding some strong weapons um with only a few levels because boon companion kind of kicks you up a whole chunk of levels which is basically like a whole weapon weight class interesting okay um so the idea here is that because i didn't know this previously it made sense to go just the minimum number of levels you you gain the companion and that's it and then you boon companion it up to level five instead of level one or you go all the way, level 10, Druid, and then you get Boon Companion to go to level 14 or whatever. Those were the examples that I gave in the last parlay, because we didn't know about the whole breakpoint situation. And now it's clear that there actually is a kind of option to fill out the gap. There is also a reason you'd go a medium number of levels, and then Boon Companion up to get to a breakpoint in their uh, weapon damage, you know, whatever their attack is. Cool. Finally, Slowly approaching the parlay debut of the witch herself, there's one more layer of Pathfinder complexity that the author deeply loves. Animal companions and familiars can take subclasses too. This was such a plot twist for me when I read the parlay the first time. Okay, so, but like, surely not, not like player subclasses. <laughs> I'm sort of having a, like, brain fart about they have their own subclasses and they, they get to choose a subclass. Right? 
I, th I think so. Let me read that animal companions converge towards medium and large with appropriately sized die, but familiars tend to be half, a quarter, or even an eighth of the player's size, pegging some low strength familiars as weaker than player owned daggers. For example, 1d2 minus 4. So they deal between. Okay. However, the Mahler class, subclass for familiars will forcibly correct the familiar's strength score by around plus 8 and size to medium. The choicest specimens, requiring some effort to identify, will turn their strength penalty into a bonus and have a weighty bite, even as just the familiar. Okay, so it sounds like they are familiar-specific subclasses. I feel like that would make no sense if they... Okay, yeah, right. Well, they don't have the same classes as players, so... Well, right? They don't, right? Okay. Um... So this is where you can manipulate this to your advantage. We talked before about the idea that you're using the the boon companion feat to get the best relative benefit. And here you can use companion subclasses to kind of do the same thing. So you pick a companion that's really, really small, but because they're really small, and thus do very, very low weapon, you know, their bite or whatever damage, they have like a really good effect or something. And then you can take that and run with it by making them take the Mahler subclass, which it sounds like basically just sets their strength and size to set amounts. So they gain the biggest relative benefit. They had the least damage to begin with, so they regained the most, and that hopefully means that their power budget was spent elsewhere and you get to keep that stuff. Imagine a spider that does less damage than a rat, for example, but that's because the spider has a venomous bite. And then if you correct the spider size to medium using the Mahler subclass, you would imagine that you would come out ahead of the rat s somehow. Sorry, rats. Uh, they can be a great companion, but you get the idea. Cool. Um, so the idea is that this allows you to kind of take this and cheat with regard to your companions. Uh, you can use the boon companion feat as well as their subclasses to kind of shunt them to be a level of effectiveness way beyond where they would normally be. This is a pretty common theme across basically all games, where you can kind of detect the game's granularity and math scaling, the fundamental math and the little details that scale it up over time that make things feel fair, and then you can take that and find a way to kind of break it. Take anything that obeys those rules, that would have been locked in those rules, and get outside of them somehow. It sounds to me like where we're going with this is that there's going to be a a witch build that has a companion that has like comically cheated the normal size rules. You know, you invested an extraordinarily low amount of resources and yet your companion has absolutely absurd output for their the relative amount you invested um, or you don't have very many you know, companion levels or whatever, and yet the companion is this, like, monster that has a ton of effectiveness? Well, I guess a familiar. Pretty interesting. Or you could get uh, a familiar corrected with the Mahler subclass, and then an animal companion corrected with boon companion to have very, very powerful companions with, again, almost no investment time leveling them up. Uh, the relative amount of cost would be very low, but you would be getting, like, two additional party members worth of companion. Pretty interesting. And of course, just having multiple bodies can be very powerful. It's been pretty shocking to me, playing Baldur's Gate 3, how just being able to manually control multiple characters under your control can make some abilities way more powerful unless you and your playgroup that you're playing with are extremely well coordinated. Like just being able to coordinate that with yourself every time I've thought of tactics with my, my other character I'm controlling that it's not even a matter of getting my other players in my playgroup on my side or not. I just didn't think of those things because I wasn't feeling as free to demand those things of my fellow players. But when I'm directly controlling both characters, I think of stuff I wouldn't have. So this is just the side, the tactical value of having multiple bodies in play. You can also potentially do some fun stuff with the fact that you own them. Like, unique, you can specialize them to synergize with your abilities in a way that would be kind of awkward if they will ever not be with you, but they won't if they're part of your build. So uh, that's interesting too. Anyway, there are some closing questions, some of which we've already addressed, but I want to read them out. So, 
How similar or equivalent are disparate parts of a game's systems? We've talked about that a lot already. The idea of different weapons kind of equaling up to a single two-handed weapon or using various feats to kind of make a companion the equivalent of a player character with a certain weapon and then kind of scaling it. Thinking of the companion as being a weapon that you are scaling up that has like a pre-attached body that can attack with it <laughs> sort of weird but but perfectly effective and easy way to think about how much you're gaining there a big difficulty in systems like this is often making sure that you've translated the effectiveness of the thing that you've made into something you can check against the game's normal math if the game is going to be so math findery it can be useful to make sure that the thing you invested your build's resources in actually measures up to the game's fundamental math, if this is a game where that really matters and you actually care about that. Which, why not? I mean, it's interesting to see how you got there a different way. The next question, after all, is what math has the developer presented or demonstrated? Is the player able to retroactively calculate or audit balance decisions? The idea is that the player has a good enough understanding, a demonstrated enough system in front of them that they can go, oh, well, if I take this route there because I want to focus on a familiar or something, I can see how because the game has this baseline of math, I've kind of matched up to that with my own thing that just got there a very different way. Even though I spent all these resources on things not like weapons, I can see that my Tyrannosaurus Rex has a weapon strength that is similar to like a fighter with a greatsword, right? And having that there helps you figure out when you've gotten something kind of good. I think it's worth stressing at this point that it doesn't need to be about the thing being as effective. It doesn't have to be that this is valuable in a game just because you're reassuring the player that what they've made like is good. It just helps you decide on opportunity cost. It helps you see, oh, I paid these resources and got something that's equivalent to this result. Whether or not you actually care that that's like good or not, it just helps you understand what you even did, like how to abstract these things. In particular, I have it on good authority that iPatch Notes would, would be thinking about how you're not going to be able to play like all of the builds for these types of games that you make, you know? And so if you won't be able to play them all, being able to abstractly think about how much effectiveness you got is kind of important for it to be enjoyable. You know, this is something that I think about build systems in general. Uh, the level of importance of making it so you can guess how effective a build will be from the onset. A game that is really bad at this, in my opinion, is Magic the Gathering. This is a game where, unless you're a very experienced player, decks that are, uh, like using a theme for example, that are really good, often look worse than mu like much inferior decks. It's just very difficult to, for me anyway, I think for a lot of players, to parse out exactly what will be effective in what way. It requires a lot of abstract math and thinking about what your opponent will do and what format, if any, you're really playing in. And that can be very difficult. It results in a situation where it's quite hard to guess what deck will be good from the start. I think one of the reasons that draft one of Magic the Gathering's most notorious formats where you kind of make decks on the spot by opening up packs, picking a card, and then passing it around. That's hard for a ton of reasons, but one of them it is, is that it's quite hard to abstract how many or, or much of certain things in my deck will feel good. You know, will I actually be able to use this? In Dungeons and Dragons, at least, in my experience, this translates into things like, do I use my bonus action in practice often enough or my character can do a combo where i use create water and then a lightning spell to do extra damage but like those are both an action and so will i actually do that combo in practice will there be enough times where i can kind of prep the create water or i gave my other character a bottle of water to throw to enable my water and lightning combos, but how often will they be in a situation where they actually want to do that instead of whatever thing they wanted to do, you know? But I think that's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to think about, okay, well, what is the, the build, the, the plan of this character? At the very least, literally just playing the character one time is usually enough to see, oh, but they want to rage at the beginning of every fight or whatever, you know? 
So personally, I think this is another part of that situation. Like having the math be clear in a way that you can kind of benchmark stuff against helps you think out loud about what would be fun about the build or what, what you've achieved by taking a certain route there. It doesn't have to be about making everything the exact same level of effectiveness necessarily. After all, the final question, are player facing numbers in the right ballpark or does the player have agency to swing higher? I think by this you mean the idea I mentioned before about upchucking the game's kind of fundamental math and finding a way to sort of get ahead of what should be according to the game's math, the weapon progression. You find a way to break outside of that and get effectiveness on your companion that really isn't what the game normally accounts for. The game normally doesn't make it easy to get this or that effectiveness, but there you go. This is kind of a specific thing, but one something that's been in the back of my mind this whole time is that this build sounds like it's getting a really indirect benefit on... You're basically leveling up a weapon, but if you look at this table from before, a lot of the weapons you would have been scaling require proficiency and multiple hands to hold, and possibly if you're dual wielding you might need feats instead to keep using them and while you're going to use a, a you know boon companion probably a feat to scale your companion or your familiar well you are getting a lot of that weapon scaling without paying all of that stuff you see what i mean you don't have to pay the feat to get the extra dual wielding attacks or whatever you don't have to you know find a good weapon that does that much damage or have the weapon around uh, you don't need to you know, make sure that your animal companion, like, has enough hit points or whatever if you're able to resummon them back and forth, or maybe your familiar can turn invisible or whatever. I don't know. Just to say that these are things that you normally wouldn't need to, you would need to worry about that if you had a fight over the greatsword, literally. But animal companions or familiars may not need to worry about that stuff. A lot of those things were just guesses. So we'll see if any of them end up being right when we actually get to the build. But I think you get my point. You get to kind of dodge a lot of the the proficiency or opportunity cost taxing that dual wielding or two weapon fighting or two handed weapon fighting, I keep getting those confused, uh, might have required by having it be not a weapon literally, yet you are getting the scaling benefits of increasing like weapon size, I guess. That's interesting. I mean, I'm very excited to see what this build is now. I sort of, I guess we it's beginning to take shape. Like, so we're going to get, are we getting an animal companion and a familiar that both Let's see what happens. Uh, folks, thank you very much for uh, listening to iPatch Notes and I's glorious journey to the Witch of Contradiction. Uh, looking forward to the next one. If you want to get your own parlay like this, you can do that using a link in the description. For now, looking forward to the next one. Thanks very much for listening. And iPatch Notes, thanks for the uh, very strange but actually fairly fun uh, way of introducing Pathfinder to me. I know that this is a really janky way to learn about it, uh, but legitimately, it is a lot of fun to hear the description of a system that you like from someone who has watched and listened to a lot of things I've made. Like, you're giving it to me in a way that is more tailored to me one way or another, even if it's just because you're tailored to you and you are someone who enjoys a lot of the things I make. Uh, this is so specifically tailored to a way I would like to be introduced to it, so that's been a lot of fun. It really has been. Thanks very much. Even though it can be hard to understand, I do really enjoy it. It is, And it was such a plot twist to me to hear the Animal Companions and Familiars getting subclasses. That's very satisfying. This game goes really far with <laughs> companions. Anyway, well, we'll see, right?